All right, go ahead, Jerry. Hi, my name is Jerry Grond, and I'm a hydrogeologist in the groundwater section of the Oregon Water Resources Department. Thank you for the opportunity to present a summary of the USGS WRD groundwater study in this recording. I'd like to acknowledge right at the very beginning, this is going to be a long presentation, uh, and that's for the sake of completeness. Uh, but when it's all said and done, we're actually just skimming uh, the surface of, of most of these topics. So please bear, bear with us. The presentations divided into the following section are components, the key takeaways, the Harney Basin Groundwater Study introduction and background, water chemistry sampling analyses and results, uh, the Harney Basin groundwater levels and their relationship to the basin's geology, the basin's groundwater budget, and the conclusion, which is a repeat of the key takeaways. And then at the very end, we have the references for the various reports. There are four key takeaways from the Harney Basin Groundwater Study important to understanding the basin's groundwater and for making effective resource management decisions and rules. Most Harney Basin groundwater is ancient, recharged from 5,000 to 30,000 years ago. Modern groundwater, that's water recharged after 1953, is limited to a thin, shallow zone beneath recharge areas. The geology in general, and the hydrostratigraphy in particular, is a major key component to understanding the Harney Basin groundwater and finding solutions to the groundwater problems. The basin's groundwater is a single hydraulic hydraulically connected groundwater flow system, a continuum both vertically and laterally. No impermeable barriers to groundwater flow are known to exist. Having said that, there are many significant variations that relate to the various geologic or hydrostratigraphic units in their hydraulic properties. And lastly, the Harney Basin groundwater budget balances in the uplands but it does not balance in the lowlands, where there's a deficit of 110,000 acre feet per year. 110,000 acre feet is enough water to cover nearly 172 square miles with one foot of water. Or to look at it a different way, to stack water more than 15.75 miles high on a single football field, about twice as high as most airlines fly. The more than 5,000 square mile Harney Basin groundwater study area is the color sh shaded area in both maps. The study area is located in the northern portion of the Water Resources Department Malheur Lake Administrative Basin. And that administrative basin boundary is the heavy black outline. As shown in the right hand map, the study area is mostly in Harney County and it encompasses three watersheds the Silvies River Watershed, the Donner und Blitzen River Watershed, and the Silver Creek Watershed. Those watersheds were defined by the Oregon Water Resources Board and published in their report in 1967. The study area and the watershed boundaries on these maps were delineated using a USGS national uh, system that delineates watersheds at different scales from national regions to sub watersheds. The sub watershed scale was used to delineate the three Harney Basin watersheds to match the three watershed areas defined by the Water Resources Board. And then the, the three watersheds were then used to delineate the study area. In addition to the watersheds and study area, uh, the Harney Basin rules adopted in 2016 to find a 2,400 square mile Greater Harney Valley groundwater area of concern, also known as GIVGAC, where new permits for groundwater use are restricted. The GIVGAC is the black hatched area in the left map and the black striped area in the right map. This presentation summarizes the groundwater study results published in six reports two primary reports by the USGS and four supporting reports by the Water Resources Department 
and two fact sheets, one by the USGS and one by the Water Resources Department. The groundwater study uh, water, water budget divides the study area for analysis, discussion, and comparison reasons only. First, it divides the study area into regions all hydraulically connected, the north, south, and west regions. These regions are similar to the watersheds, but they are different. The regions include groundwater considerations, whereas the watersheds are based solely on surface water considerations. The water budget secondly divides the study area into uplands, which is outside the yellow boundary, and the lowlands inside the yellow boundary. And the uplands and the lowlands are hydraulically connected. The lowlands are about a thousand square miles within the center of the basin, and is generally based upon the mapped extent of the quaternary alluvium that's composed of deposits of clay, silt, and sand and gravel that were deposited less than two and a half million years ago. The six Harney Basin reports list one or more of the authors on this slide. The reports acknowledge other USGS and WRD staff, as well as other federal, state, county, and local agencies, department, and individuals. The study benefited from legislative house bills collaboratively and jointly sponsored by state representatives Mark Owens and representative Ken Helm. And the study also benefited from water resources and USGS management who made resources and staff available. Multiple previous hydrologic studies were conducted in the Harney Basin beginning in the early 1900s. They are referenced in our reports, but I wanna note three here. Two of them are groundwater related, one by Piper and others published in 1939 and the other by Leonard published in 1970. Both studies are generally limited geographically to the Harney Valley area. The blue contours in the left map are copied from Piper and others, and the data are from 1931 to 1932. The red contours in the right map are copied from Le the Leonard study and the data are from 1968 and 69. The current study presented today addresses the entire Harney Basin. I should note that both Piper and Leonard distinguish groundwater at shallow wells versus groundwater at deeper wells. The current study presented today addresses groundwater at shallow wells versus groundwater in deeper wells also. The water in the deeper and the shallow wells are hydraulically connected even when they behave differently. Additionally, the Piper report noted the influence of native vegetation on groundwater levels at shallow wells. The current study's water budget accounts for groundwater discharge uh, via evapotranspiration by native vegetation and by crops. The third report relates to Malheur Lake and it was done by Hubbard and published in 1975. That report noted that the Sodhouse Spring discharge to the lake was estimated as 8,000 to 9,000 acre feet in 1972 and 1973, respectively. Apart from Sodhouse Spring, the water exchange between the lake and groundwater, both the inflow and outflow, was determined to be negligible. Similarly, the current study's water budget calculated an inflow and outflow exchange of less than a thousand acre feet per year for both Harney and Malheur lakes. This is notable given that the lakes are usually the low point and the end point for both surface water and groundwater. When the study team discussed the small exchange of water between the lakes and groundwater, Amanda Garcia at the USGS and the lead uh, author for the water budget report Noted, noted observing similar small exchanges in Nevada's closed basins. She noted that often groundwater dependent vegetation surrounding the lakes suck up and use the groundwater before it can flow into the lakes. Subsequent study data in both the flow direction and water chemistry indicates the same is occurring in the Harney Basin. So what led up to the current groundwater study? Let's begin with crane, the Crane vicinity. The Crane vicinity is the star on the east side of the basin on the inset map. 
Prior to 2010, Water Resources Department received repeated well complaints that noted well-to-well -well groundwater level interference and well site instability causing the ground to repeatedly collapse around at least one well, as shown in the inset photo, that required repeated loads of gravel to refill the collapse. Additionally, there was concern about possible long-term groundwater level decline. Leonard, in his 1970 report, noted observing possible 1960s decline, which can be seen in the upper left-hand corner of the graph, and warned a future risk of decline. After 20, 2000, after the year 2000, Water Resources Department measured groundwater levels at more wells to get a sense of the trend, five wells from 2008 to 2012. A definite groundwater level decline was observed. A more recent closer look shows that the groundwater levels after 2000, shown on the right-hand side of the graph, are lower than Malheur Lake and Harney Lake levels, which were near 4,100 feet in 1983. Now let's look at the Weaver Springs vicinity. The Weaver Springs vicinity is at the star near the center of the study area in the left inset map. And it's in the lower left corner of the right map, inset map, and it's with the colored circles and, and rectangles. In terms of groundwater development, after the 1980s, there was significant groundwater development requested and authorized for the Reaver Springs vicinity. The green shapes in the right inset map show authorized groundwater use with priority dates before 1990. The red shapes on the right inset map show authorized groundwater use with priority dates 1990 and later. After 2000, the Water Resources Department measured groundwater levels at more Weaver Springs vicinity wells, starting with 15 wells from 20, 2008 to 2012. The data in this graph shows the decline rate varies with location, whereby the decline is greatest within the heart of the development and less at the development outskirts or periphery. And as a spoiler alert, the smaller decline is due to the distance and change in geology. And I want to draw us back to note that the declines began about the mid 1990s when the increased request for groundwater use occurred. Now let's jump to February of 2014. The Water Resources Department received multiple protests and each protest addressed a different proposed final order approving a new groundwater permit. From the fall of 2014 to the spring of 2015, the Water Resources Department conducted a preliminary analysis comparing Water Resources Department authorized use in total volume per year to annual groundwater recharge also in total volume per year. A USGS review noted a groundwater recharge estimates by Robeson published in 1968. The water resources analysis indicated authorized annual groundwater use exceeded the annual groundwater recharge. The results of this 2014-2015 analysis, as well as observed groundwater level declines and the limited geographic ge scope of previous studies made apparent the need for a comprehensive basin-wide groundwater study. Before moving to the next slide, I would like to note the following in the table that's shown in this slide. The values in the groundwater discharge column implies groundwater discharge to surface water, including likely discharge to springs. These values were from the Water Resources Department water availability tables during the lowest flow months of August to October. The values in the unaccounted difference column implies unaccounted natural groundwater discharge, such as evaporation and plant transpiration. It does not imply groundwater available for use. An earlier version of this table was adapted to create the bar graph frequently seen at previous presentations. The earlier table had a smaller volume for permitted groundwater, nearly 26,000 acre feet less, 
And that was due to pending data still not entered into the water rights database. The chronology in this slide lists a number of events from 2015 to 2022 that directly or indirectly related to the Harney Basin groundwater study. The highlights are in 2015, the Water Resources Department began increasing the well network for groundwater level measurements in anticipation of the groundwater study. In 2016, the Harney Basin rules were adopted in April of 2016. The rules created the Greater Harney Valley Groundwater Area of Concern and restricted issuance of any new groundwater permits. The rules also ordered a groundwater study and noted a completion date for the reports. The rules ordered a creation of a Harney Basin Study Advisory Committee organized by the county court and the Water Resources Department. And that committee met seven, had 17 meetings that were conducted from May of 2016 to December of 2019. The USGS Water Resources Department Groundwater Study Plan was approved in December of 2016. From 2017 to 2019, the effort was focused on data collection and analyses were conducted during this period. Initial data interpretations were reported to the Harney Basin Study Advisory Committee in December 2019. In 2020, was devoted to writing multiple reports and conducting initial report reviews, and then 2021 to 2022 focused on completing the reviews and releasing the six reports. Hank Johnson at the USGS led the study's water chemistry collection and data analyses. The chemistry data significantly informed our understanding of the basin's groundwater flow systems. Samples came from wells, springs, and streams, as well as Moon Reservoir, Malheur Mar, uh, uh, Malheur Cave, plant tissues, and soil water. The samples were analyzed for geochemical tracers, tritium, carbon-14, and stable isotopes. And these tracers were useful for determining groundwater recharge sources, rates of water movement and residence time, and confirming and refining groundwater flow paths. The USGS hydrology report by Gingrich and others of 2022 provides an excellent explanation of the tracers, how they are used, and the implication of the data results for understanding the groundwater system within different portions of the study area. Additionally, Hank gave a thorough presentation at the May 2019 Harney Basin Study Advisory Committee meeting. In addition to the studies chemistry work, DEQ conducted their own sampling analyses independent of the study. DEQ made their data analyses available to the studies, however. The DEQ samples came from 91 wells, and the samples were analyzed for multiple water quality parameters that can be divided into the major categories listed on this slide. So the first takeaway is, what does the chemistry tell us? It tells us that the Harney Basin groundwater is ancient. Much of the deep upland groundwater and most of the lowland groundwater was recharged 5,000 to 30,000 years ago when conditions were cooler and wetter than today. Modern groundwater that is recharged after 1953 is mostly limited to a thin shallow zone between the recharge areas. In addition to the study results, DEQ results indicate that 58% of the 91 wells sampled had one or more contaminants posing a human health concern. 80% of the 91 wells sampled had arsenic detected, with 31% of the 91 wells sampled that had arsenic exceeding the EPA maximum contaminant level. And 93% of the 91 wells sampled had boron detected with 23 of the 91 wells exceeding the long-term health advisory level for children, and six of the 91 wells exceeding the lifetime health advisory for adults. So in addition to the water chemistry, we measured water levels across the basin. And uh, the water levels 
uh, came from about 230 study located wells, mostly located in the lowlands. But we also had reported water right permit condition groundwater level measurements at about 200 wells located in the lowlands that were submitted to the department. Additionally, there's the National Hydrologic Database locations for more than 2,500 springs, mostly located in the uplands. And then there was the wells that were measured by the Harney Watershed Council, 27 wells that are not shown in this figure. And there were also temporary shallow borings uh, for temporary measurements that are also not shown. And these data were used for groundwater level maps to determine the groundwater flow direction or the hydraulic gradient, recharge areas and discharge areas. And also for making groundwater level graphs for determining groundwater level trends, any vertical gradients, and to assess groundwater response to stress, such as pumping and recharge. A USGS Water Resources uh, Department collaborative team led by Steve Gingrich worked multiple weeks to produce two groundwater level maps consistent with all the available data, water, groundwater level data and other data. First was the water table map, the left-hand map. This map is an elevation contour map of the top of the groundwater across the basin. The lowlands contour lines in the center of the basin are 10 foot contour intervals and are predominantly based upon the shallow wells that are 150 feet or less in total depth. And the upland contour lines are 500 foot contour intervals and are predominantly based upon spring related data. The second map is the potential metric surface map, the right hand map. This map is an elevation contour map of the static groundwater levels representing groundwater at depth groundwater that's below the water table. The groundwater at depth is hydraulically connected to the groundwater at or near the water table. The contour lines in this map are limited to the lowlands only given the available data. The contour lines are 10 foot contour intervals based upon data predominantly related to wells deeper than 150 feet. Now let's zoom into both maps and take a closer look at the contours within the lowlands. The first thing to note are cones of depression, a depression within a limited area. Note the solid line and dotted line circles and ovals. At the Weaver Springs Dog Mountain area, the solid line north of Harney Lake in both maps, the depression is, occurs in both the shallow and the deep groundwater. At Crane, the solid line east of Malheur Lake in both maps, the depression again occurs in both the shallow and the deep groundwater. At North Harney Valley, the solid line north of Highway 20 east of Burns in the potential metric map, the depression occurs in the deep groundwater, but not in the shallow groundwater. Then there are isolated depressions enclosed by the dotted line in the potential metric map. These isolated depressions occur in the deep groundwater, but not in the shallow groundwater. The second thing to note are the flat gradient areas. At Virginia Valley, the dashed line southeast of Malheur Lake in the water table map, a flat gradient occurs in the shallow groundwater and there's a gradual area-wide decline. At the Silver Creek drainage, the dashed line on the left side of the potential metric map a flat gradient occurs in the deep groundwater and there's a gradual area-wide decline. So why? Why is there a flat gradient in some areas and a cone of depression or a steeper gradient in other areas? And why is a cone of depression shallow and deep in some areas and deep only in other areas? Now let's look at some groundwater level uh, hydrographs representing different lowland areas. These two graphs represent two different locations within the Weaver Springs Dog Mountain Cone of Depression. Each graph represents the groundwater level at closely spaced well pairs constructed for the study, a shallow well and a deep well for each pair. At the Weaver Springs well pair, the shallow well is about 191 feet total depth and the deep well's total depth is 490 feet. 
Note that the shallow and the deep groundwater level decline rates are similar, about eight feet per year. And also note that the shallow and the deep seasonal groundwater fluctuations are similar. And that the shallow and the deep groundwater levels are typically within five feet of each other. And in this graph, the shallow level is above the deeper level, indicating a downward gradient. At the Dog Mountain well pair, the well pair is this well pair is located about eight miles north of the Weaver Springs well pair. The deep well is about 510 feet total depth, and the shallow well total depth is about 105 feet. Note that the shallow and the deep groundwater level decline rates are different. Also note that the shallow and the deep seasonal groundwater level fluctuations differ. And that the shallow and the deep groundwater levels are about 15 feet apart, and the deep level is above the shallow level, indicating an upward gradient. So again, why? Why are the Weaver Springs and the Dog Mountain hydrographs different when these wells are only about eight miles apart? Now let's look at the groundwater levels at a triple set of wells north of the Eastern Oregon Agricultural Research Center outside of Burns outside of their headquarter area. The well site is about 6.3 miles north of the Dog Mountain well pair. There is no corner depression, but the contour lines are closer together, indicating a steeper gradient. The deep well total depth is 543 feet. The shallow well total depth is 22 feet, and the intermediate well total depth is 125 feet. The shallow to deep groundwater level decline rates are somewhat civil, similar, about one to two feet per year. The shallow to deep seasonal fluctuations have similarities and difference. The shallow and the deep seasonal fluctuations are smoother than the intermediate fluctuations. The deep fluctuations have a smaller amplitude than the shallow and the intermediate uh, fluctuations. The shallow to deep groundwater levels are all within about five feet of each other. And note that the vertical gradient is towards the intermediate groundwater, meaning that there's a downward gradient from above and an upward gradient from below, given that the shallow and the deep groundwater levels are most often above the intermediate groundwater levels. So again, why? Why is there a dual vertical gradient? Why is the amplitude of the deeper groundwater seasonal fluctuations smaller than the shallow and the intermediate groundwater seasonal fluctuations? Now let's look at a shallow and a deep well pair near Lawn and at two nearby wells in the Crane vicinities. The Lawn vicinity and the Crane vicinity are within different cones of depression. So let's look first at the Lawn well pair. The shallow well total depth is 76 feet and the deep well total depth is about 496 feet. The shallow and the deep groundwater level decline rates are very so different. The shallow level is relatively steady, whereas the deep level has a decline rate of about 2.3 feet per year. The shallow and the deep seasonal fluctuations are very different, about one foot versus more than 40 feet. And the shallow and the deep groundwater level differences is increasing with time, meaning the downward gradient is increasing with time. Next, the green facility uh, has two nearby wells. The shallow well total depth is about 130 feet and the deep well total depth is 600 feet. And these two wells are about 6.7 miles apart. The shallow and the deep annual groundwater level decline rates differ about one to two and a half feet per year. The shallow and deep seasonal groundwater fluctuations are very different about one to five feet versus more than 80 feet. However, the shallow and the deep groundwater levels before each irrigation so, uh, season are somewhat similar within five feet of each other. So why? Why is there a large seasonal fluctuation in the deep groundwater and a muted to no seasonal fluctuation in the shallow groundwater? And why does the shallow groundwater show no or minimal annual decline at lawn 
and a persistent steady decline at the crane vicinity. Now let's look at two nearby wells in the Blitzen Valley near Malheur Lake and a shallow and a deep well pair in Virginia Valley. These wells are at the west and the east end of a flat grading area south of Malheur Lake. First, the nearby wells in the Blitzen Valley near Malheur Lake. The shallow well total depth is 147 feet and the deep well total depth is 500 feet and the wells are about two miles apart. The shallow and the deep annual decline rates are the same, about 1.3 feet per year. And the shallow and the deep seasonal fluctuations are the same, about less than two feet per year. And the shallow and the deep groundwater levels are essentially the same, essentially no vertical gradient. Next in the Virginia Valley well pair, the shallow well total depth is 145 feet and the deep well total depth is 370 feet. This well pair is more than 19 miles east of the Blitzen Valley wells. The shallow and the deep annual decline rate are the same about a half a foot a year. The shallow and the deep seasonal fluctuations are the same, less than three and a half feet per year. And the shallow and the deep groundwater levels are the same, basically no vertical gradient. So why are the shallow and the deep groundwater levels, annual decline and seasonal fluctuations locally the same? And why do the shallow and the deep groundwater levels and the annual decline and seasonal fluctuation differ with location? Now let's look at uh, three dispersed wells near Riley in the Silver Creek Valley. The south deep well it has a total depth of about 425 feet and is 3.3 miles south of the Riley Junction. The south shallow well has a total depth of 75 feet and is 3.8 miles southeast of the Riley Junction and about 1.7 miles east of the South Deep Well. And the North Deep Well has a total depth of 595 feet and is 3.9 miles northwest of the Riley Junction or about 7.2 miles northwest of the South Deep Well. The annual decline weights are generally similar from 0.4 to 0.7 feet per year. The seasonal fluctuations are generally similar, ranging from two to four feet. And the groundwater levels are generally within five feet of each other. And the vertical gradient is downward. So why? Why such similarity over such a large area? So the study needed to answer why. In regards to the cones of the depression in the flat gradient areas, why are there cones of depression in some areas and flat gradients in other areas? Why are cones of depression shallow and deep in some areas and just deep in other areas? In regards to the shallow and the deep uh, groundwater level trends, both seasonal and annual, why are the seasonal and annual trends the same, same and close in some areas? And why do the trends in some areas show different seasonal amplitude, but the same annual decline? And why do trends in some areas show different seasonal amplitude and different annual decline? Answering why required exploring the hydraulic property relationship to geology and groundwater development. So let's connect geology to groundwater flow. So, Groundwater controls groundwater occurrence, recharge, flows, and storage. Over multiple decades, the geology of the basin has been studied and mapped at various scales by state and federal agencies and university researchers. These studies identified a complex sequence of interfingering and faulted volcanic deposits and sedimentary deposits from various sources that rest at least in part upon a basement of older rocks. The numerous eruptive centers and fissures appear as red dots, circles, and lines on the tectonic map on the right-hand side of this slide. Most of the rocks are less than 16 million years old as displayed on the time chart. The oldest rocks are the marine deposits more than 145 million years old and is the lone unit near the bottom of the time chart. 
These older rocks are exposed in the northern uplands within the shaded area near the top of the tectonic map. These rocks are presumed to be the basement underlying most of the bay, basin, occurring at depths below the bottom of 1,500 foot to more than 8,400 foot deep oil exploration wells in the Harney Valley. For the study, Dark Boschman developed a seamless and consistent geologic map for the entire Harney Basin compiled from 15 maps that were published from 1956 to 2001. And he had the aid of available rock age dating and geochemical analyses, elevation data, high resolution aerial imagery, and new detailed geologic mapping by Department of Geology in Oregon and also PSU and field reconnaissance work that Dark did himself. More than 100 unique geologic map unit names in the 15 maps were grouped into 18 geologic map units for the Harney Basin geologic map based upon similar geologic origins, physical properties, and stratigraphic position. Dark used the 18 geologic units to interpret subsurface materials reported by well drillers at more than 1,100 wells within the basin. Before leaving the slide, I'd like to draw your attention to two things on the tectonic map. First thing to note is the Northwest trending uh, Brothers Fault Zone that extends from Steens Mountain through the southwest portion of the study area, this line right through here. And the second thing is the blue shaded area on the tectonic map that shows the maximum extent of the Paleo Lake Malheur, from which uh, many of the deposits in the uh, valley uh, uh, originate. So now let's connect the geology to groundwater flow. To do that, we visit Henry Darcy, an engineer in France. Darcy was studying the flow of water through sand. He needed to engineer a sand silter for the city water supply. He noted the volumetric flow weight of water through the sand was directly proportional to the change in water level across the length of the filter, which we call the hydraulic gradient, and the cross-sectional area of the filter. And he developed the flow equation we now call Darcy's Law. Hydraulic conductivity, K in the equation, is the proportionality constant. Darcy's Law is the basic governing equation for groundwater flow. The Darcy's Law equation is essentially the water version of Ohm's Law, which is the equation for electricity. For electricity, different wires of different gauge and material have different resistances that directly affect the rate of electronic flow. During uh, different geologic deposits have different hydraulic conductivity that directly affect the rate of water flow. Now, transmissivity is related to hydraulic conductivity and transmissivity is hydraulic conductivity times the cross-sectional area height and is often used to indicate the flow properties of geologic depo uh, deposits. And it's used in this presentation. So how do we determine transmissivity? One of the ways is through aquifer tests. That is the first and preferred method where we turn on a single well and monitor the groundwater level drawdown during pumping and the groundwater level recovery during shutoff. During the test, we monitor the water level over time within the pumped well and hopefully at nearby observation wells. And then the measurement data for each well will yield a time drawdown recovery graph. Tice in 1935 published an equation used to determine two things from the drawdown data, transmissivity and the storage coefficient. Cooper and Jacob in 1946 found that the Tice equation can be simplified when certain conditions are met, and that this equation is better to use when analyzing the pumped well data. Another method for determining transmissivity are well yield tests. In, in this particular test, measurement occurs at the pumped well only, and it's typically only two measurements, where we measure the water level just before pumping 
and measure the water level just before the pump shuts off. The measurements and pumping rate are used to calculate a specific capacity, which is total drawdown divided by the pumping rate. This study used a Tice equation-based numerical method developed by Voorhees and published in 1979 to convert the specific capacity to transmissivity. So where did our transmissivity uh, test data come from? First of all, we had 33 aquifer tests. Uh, we had one interference test conducted by the, the department we had two uh, department recorder at two wells installed located near irrigation wells. And then we had 41 single well pump tests that were submitted to the department. Additionally, there were more than 1400 driller reported well yield tests for specific capacity. And over 1100 of those are within the Harney Basin itself and 290 occur in the area that surround the basin. Different methods were used to calculate transmissivity depending upon the data source type. For the aquifer test, a graphical method was used, the two graphs on the left-hand side. <clears throat> you know, there's, for the test with observation well, we use the Tice log-log curve, which is the lower graph. And for the single well at the pumping well, we use the Jacob Cooper semi-log plot which is the upper graph on the right left-hand side. We, we tested the results and plotted up the data to see if we could reproduce water levels during an irrigation season, and we're pleased to find that we could. For the well yield test, the Voorhees method that I just mentioned uh, was used to uh, the Tice equation to calculate the transmissivity. The method and the results of both of these methods are presented in the appendices of the Grandin Report of 2021. The range of transmissivity values calculated is large, over six orders of magnitude, from one to one million feet squared per day. Feet squared per day is the unit of measurement for transmissivity. The median value is within the circle on the graph and it's about a thousand feet squared per day with half the values larger and half the values smaller. 90% of the values calculated are less than 13,000 feet squared per day. This is generally on the low end of the, of the scale uh, for transmissivity values, but it's not surprising given the kind of deposits in the Harney Basin. The multicolored curved line represent transmissivity determined from aquifer test data data basically uh, collected from irrigation wells. They show slightly larger transmissivity than the green curved line representing transmissivity determined from the well yield test data. This is not surprising given wells selected for irrigation are offer higher production and higher yield. However, when we had wells where there was both an aquifer test and a well yield test, the transmissivity calculated for the well yield test gave uh, generally larger transmissivity values than wells uh, values calculated from the aquifer test data for the same well. And this is shown by the dots above the diagonal line in the right-hand graph. This may be due to the fact that the well yield tests occur, generally occur when the well is young and fresh, and the aquifer test occurs when the well has been used and has degraded a bit and lost some efficiency. This slide shows the spatial distribution of transmissivity values across the basin. Note that the smaller transmissivity values occur across the entire basin and even occur among the large values. The larger transmissivity values locations are more limited. The largest transmissivity values are shown in the right map. They generally occur along the periphery of Harney Valley, within the upper, upper Silver Creek floodplain near Riley, within the Wilvers, uh, Weaver Springs Dog Mountain vicinity, and south of Malheur Lake to Virginia Valley. The distribution gets even more segregated when you take into consideration well depth, wells deeper than 150 feet versus greater than 150 feet. The important, the important point here 
is the transmissivity spatial distribution is mixed, which is important to understanding the groundwater system response to development. The study explored tying the transmissivity values to the uh, stratigraphic or geologic units. The first step was identifying stratigraphic units for as many wells as possible. Driller descriptions on well reports or well logs for more than 2,200 wells were converted to one or more lithologic codes per well. Then these lithologic codes for more than, for nearly 1,500 wells of the 2,200 wells were related to stratigraphic units. The second step was assigning the well's transmissivity to a single stratigraphic unit. And that assignment occurred only if a single unit occupied more than 90% of a well's open interval. The study successfully tied transmissivity values to the 18 stratigraphic units. It yielded a range of values per stratigraphic unit as shown in the left graph. The stratigraphic units were arranged from the largest transmissivity values in me value median at the top to the lowest values in value medium at the bottom. These 18 stratigraphic units were then grouped into nine hydrostratigraphic units, the right graph, based upon similar geologic properties and similar hydraulic transmissivity properties. The largest median values tended to be the younger units and the smallest median values tended to be the older uh, rock units. So we successfully correlated the transmissivity of the stratigraphic units and then grouped them into these hydrostratigraphic units. And these informed other parts of the study. First, again, we were able to establish hydrostratigraphic units, but we were also, it was useful for helping us understand the groundwater flow within the basin, the groundwater response to pumping, and the water budget within the basin. So our takeaway from this effort was the following, that the hydrostratigraphy is a major key to understanding the Harney Basin groundwater. It helps us understand the groundwater flow within the basin, the flat gradient versus the steeper gradient areas, it helps us understand the groundwater response to pumping, the cone of depression areas versus the area-wide decline. The effects of pumping vary across the basin depending on the local geology, the amount of recharge and the amount of withdrawal. Pumping large volumes of groundwater from low transmissivity rocks causes deep drawdown over relatively small areas. And pumping large volumes of groundwater from high transmissivity rocks causes shallow drawdown over large area. And this hydrostratigraphic understanding and tie to transmissivity helps us understand the water budget within the basin by helping us understand the controls on recharge and discharge. So let's look at five locations. First, let's stop at Weaver Springs. Here we have vent deposits occurring both shallow and deep. Those vent deposits are, low, are enclosed by low permeability or low transmissivity deposits. The groundwater response to pumping is efficient laterally and vertically within the vent deposits. However, the surrounding low transmissivity deposits yield water slowly to the vent deposits. As a result, a significant cone of depression, both shallow and deep, occurs within the vent deposit that spreads more slowly into the low transmissivity deposits. Our second stop is North Harney Valley. The area is dominated with younger and older basin fill. The local basin fill deposits are generally coalescing alluvial fan deposits related to multiple streams entering the lowlands from the uplands. Coarser grained, higher transmissivity deposits occur near the uplands and smaller grained, lower transmissivity deposits occur away from the uplands. Mostly deeper groundwater in the area was developed. A cone of depression developed, but within the deeper groundwater only. The shallow water table groundwater response is muted. 
the shallow groundwater levels generally stay within five to 20 feet below land surface. The third stop is the grain vicinity. The area is dominated with younger and older basin fill. There's coarser grain, higher transmissivity deposits near the stink water uplands, where most local development is within these deposits. And then there's smaller grain, lower transmissivity deposits away from the uplands. And there's a relatively small island of vent deposits at Warren Springs Butte. And there is some development along the margins of these deposits. An extensive corner depression, shallow and deep, has developed near the stink water uplands. And then there's less extensive cones of depression, primarily deep, and those are developing away from the stink water uplands, and they tend to be isolated. Our fourth stop is the Silver Creek floodplain above and below Riley, from Mayo Ranch to Moon Reservoir. The area has an extensive large transmissivity zone that occurs deep only. It's the hatched zone in the figure. The large transmissivity zone includes multiple stratigraphic units, including some that are generally lower transmissivity. It appears something happened after the units were deposited, such as a development of the Brothers Fault Zone, causing secondary permeability resulting in larger transmissivity. Groundwater development is mostly within the extensive large transmissivity zone, resulting in near uniform seasonal fluctuations within the deeper groundwater over a broad area, and near annual uh, groundwater level declines within the deeper groundwater occurring over a broad area. The lower transmissivity younger basin fill overlies and blankets the deeper large transmissivity deposits. The water table is generally within the few tens of feet of land surface, and the groundwater response in this uh, shallow groundwater is, uh, is often muted when exposed to pumping in the deeper zone. Our fifth and final stop for this presentation is the North Uplands. The upland deposits are generally low transmissivity. Consequently, most groundwater recharge, 83%, travels short flow paths to become upland spring discharge or upland stream base flow. And the remaining 17% travels thousands of years directly to the lowlands. So what can we take away from this? That the Harney, Harney Basin groundwater is a single hydraulically connected system, a continuum. Groundwater generally flows towards Harney and Malheur lakes from the surrounding uplands. Groundwater from land surface to death is hydraulically connected even when static water levels and water level trends differ. Groundwater from location to location is hydraulically connected even when groundwater source and flow paths differ. Hydrostratigraphy is the predominant control on groundwater flow in response to development. And water chemistry data supports this finding. Chemical changes with depth and or location have lo logical explanations, including but not limited to mixing and chemical processes. So now let's talk about the groundwater budget and let's begin with some basic concepts. During pre-development, there's a dynamic equilibrium where inflow equals outflow. <clears throat> the natural inflow to groundwater includes precipitation, surface water loss to the subsurface, and groundwater inflow from neighboring areas. And natural groundwater outflow includes groundwater outflow to surface water, evaporation, plant transpiration, and groundwater outflow to a neighboring area. The groundwater levels are steady long-term, but can have short-term variability. Stored water is not static, but moves from where inflow occurs to where outflow occurs, similar to water moving through a lake or a reservoir. During post-development, engineered withdrawals are added to the groundwater system, primarily wells. Water is removed by wells 
is often at the expense of the stored water component and or the natural discharge component of the groundwater system. And this is reflected over the long term by lower groundwater levels and decreased discharge to streams, springs, lakes, and vegetation. If development is within the capacity of the groundwater resource, a new equilibrium is established where the average annual water gain and loss balances, but a smaller volume of stored water is maintained. This is reflected by a stable lower groundwater level and less water discharging naturally from the system. If the development exceeds the capacity of the groundwater resource, the average annual water gained and lost does not balance. The imbalance is at the expense of the stored groundwater component, which shrinks over time, reflected by groundwater level declines over the long term, and also at the expense of the natural discharge component, which shrinks and may stop over the long term. Exceeding the capacity of the groundwater resource can cause long-term injury to existing groundwater and surface water rights and to the local groundwater and surface water resource. The Harney Basin water budget data sources include climate data from multiple sources, soil data, land cover data, satellite imagery, published, unpublished, and or study conducted flow measurements, study conducted water and plant chemistry sampling and analyses, WRD water right data, Oregon Health Authority uh, community water system data, WRD well construction data, uh, reported groundwater pumpage data submitted to the department, and publishes, published indices for various water uses from multiple sources. The water, water budget details and results are presented in Garcia and others, where the entire water budget is, is presented in detail. In Gingrich and others, the entire water budget is provided in summary form. In Beamer, Beamer and Hoskinson, which focuses on the irrigation usage in detail, and in Grondon, where the non-irrigation usage is provided in detail. So let's first look at the upland water budget, namely the upland recharge and discharge. Upland groundwater flow paths are shallow and limited by low permeability. As a result, most upland recharge travels relatively short distance in the subsurface and then discharges nearby. This groundwater discharge is the primary source of flow in the upland st streams, springs, wetlands, and meadows during the dry summer months. About 17% of the recharge stays in the subsurface and flows to the lowlands. The uplands are closest to a near natural conditions because there's limited groundwater development and total recharge and total discharge are essentially equal. Now let's move to the lowlands and look at the lowland groundwater recharge. The total lowland groundwater recharge is about 173,000 acre feet per year. About 68% of the lowland recharge is from infiltration of surface water that mostly originated in the uplands as upland runoff and upland groundwater discharge to upland surface water. In the lowlands, this water infiltrates into the, into the groundwater system via stream canal seepage, flood water seepage, lake seepage, and surface water source irrigation seepage. About 28% of the lowland recharge is from groundwater inflow from the uplands. About 5% of the lowland recharge is from reinfiltration of groundwater that had been pumped in the lowlands. Groundwater that's sourced for irrigation seepage and groundwater source non-irrigation seepage via septic systems or other uh, systems similar to that. Now let's consider the lowland groundwater discharge. Total lowland discharge is about 283,000 acre feet per year. About 45% of the lowland groundwater discharge occurs via evapotranspiration and spring discharge. 
about 54% of the lowland groundwater discharge occurs via groundwater pumpage. The mean annual groundwater pumpage for 2017-2018 for irrigation was about 145,000 acre feet, which accounts for more than 95% of all groundwater pumpage and has increased threefold since the early 1990s. Non-irrigation pumpage accounts for nearly 5% of all groundwater pumpage. About 1% of the lowland groundwater discharge occurs via groundwater flow to the Malheur River Basin. The total lowland recharge minus the total lowland discharge yields a total imbalance or deficit of about 110,000 acre feet per year. Pumpage is removing groundwater from aquifer storage and is likely capturing a small amount of natural discharge. The largest uh, budget deficit is in the northern region where pumpage is exceeding recharge. Let's take a closer look at groundwater pumpage from 1930 to 2018. This graph shows groundwater pumpage estimated for the GIVGAC area. Groundwater pumpage for the non-irrigation use is dominated from the 1930s to the 1950s, but total pumpage was less than 20,000 acre feet per year. Groundwater pumpage for irrigation use dominated after 1980. This graph shows groundwater pumpage estimated for the entire area that's being modeled in the USGS groundwater model, which includes areas outside of the study area. The current entire model area pumpage total difference from the GIVGEC area pumpage is less than two is less than 20 acre feet. So what is our takeaway from the, the water budget? The upland groundwater budget is minimally affected by groundwater development and generally represents the natural system. The lowland groundwater budget accounts for most of the groundwater development and is out of balance by about 110,000 acre feet per year. The imbalance is primarily seen as groundwater removed from storage accompanied by declining groundwater levels. There's likely a capture of small amounts of natural discharge. And the largest deficit is in the north region where pumpage exceeds recharge. So again, the study's four key takeaways are these. Most Harney Basin groundwater is ancient, recharged from 5,000 to 30,000 years ago. Modern groundwater that is recharged after 1953 is limited to a thin, shallow zone beneath the recharge areas. Geology in general and hydrostratigraphy in, in particular is the major key to understanding the Harney Basin groundwater and finding solution to the groundwater problems. And the Harney Basin groundwater is a single hydraulically connected groundwater flow system, a continuum uh, vertically and laterally connected. No impermeable barriers to groundwater flow are known to exist. Having said that, there are many significant variations that relate to the various geologic units and their hydraulic properties. And lastly, the Harney Basin groundwater budget balances in the uplands, but does not balance in the lowlands, where there's a deficit of 110,000 acre feet per year. And with that, I'd like to thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions when we meet live online on the 27th of July of 2017. And for our reports, these are the references that you can uh, look them up, and the online connections are provided with these references. Thank you.